Hold up. Wait a minute. <laughs> I wish you love, peace, and hair grease. Love, peace, and hair grease, y'all. This is Carla Renata, aka the Curvy Critic, and I shoot straight from the hip. Yeah, you know I'm shooting straight from the hip. Let's take a trip around the curve. Hampton, but we the real <laughs> age you. Know. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I know I wasn't here um, last week, but I was out and about doing some things. So I am back this week. If this is your first time here, please click subscribe to the channel. If you are on YouTube, give me a big thumbs up to let me know that you were here. Yay! Woo! I got a jam-packed show for y'all, so I don't want to waste any time. I have two of the women from the Jurassic World Dominion franchise, and I have Mamadou Athi, who is from Jurassic World Dominion, and I also have Miss Felicia Henderson. If that name sounds familiar, baby, she has written and been the showrunner on almost every show sitcom that has Black people in it on television, including the award-winning uh, series Soul Food, and now she has something coming to Netflix, which we're going to talk about in a really in-depth interview. So um, I usually start out talking about what I did the week before, but before I get to that, let me say hello to my boy Brandon. He is always here, and he always has stuff to tell me. So this time, hey, real review, thank you. I try to look as as wonderful as I can for y'all. You know, a sister be trying to do her best. So thank you for joining me. Brandon says he had a great weekend. Memorial Day was two weeks ago. Yes, it was. He saw Bob's Burger and um, he loved it. Can't wait to watch it again. And now the next movie this month is Lightyear. Absolutely. And hopefully I'll be invited to see that. And I'll come back here and talk about that as well. But today I'm going to talk about Jurassic World. I'm going to talk about Lost Illusions, which was the big winner at the Cesar Awards in France, which is a precursor to the Cannes Film Festival. I'm going to talk about Hustle, that's starring Adam Sandler and Queen Latifah. And of course, I'm going to talk about Jurassic World. So let me tell you what I did last week. I was Everything was all encompassing because I covered the ATX Film Festival. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's a film festival that primarily deals with television content. And I'm so excited because I got to interview the cast of Flowers in the Attic, The Origin. If you are not familiar with Flowers in the Attic, it is a book series by V, as in Victor, C, like as in Cat, Andrews. I love her books, have read 11 out of the 14. Yes, 11 out of the 14. I've read 11 out of the 14 of her novels. And now they have brought a, a plethora of her books to life on the Lifetime channel. And they're bringing another one, Lifetime, um, Flowers in the Attic, The Origin. And I'll have those interviews for you in a couple of weeks. I also, um, like a lot of people paid attention to the MTV Movie Awards. And let me tell you something. I always say Jennifer Lopez owes her career to me because I auditioned as a fly girl <laughs> for In Living Color and I couldn't do act role. But Miss Thing could flip and dip and all of that. So there you go. But And I'm, I'm totally kidding. But she was uh, awarded the Generation Award as well as Best Song at the MTV uh, Movie Awards last night. And she gave the most unusual um, thank you speech I'd ever heard. She thanked the people that hurt her feelings. She thanked the people that broke her heart. And she thanked the people that told her to her face that she was not going to be right where she is. Just goes to show it only take one person to believe in you. And if that one person is you, that's all you need. I also took a trip to the red carpet of Ms. Marvel. Ms. Marvel is coming to Disney Plus this week, yo. And it is dealing with brown people at the helm. We got a little brown girl playing Ms. Marvel. I can't wait for y'all to see it on Disney Plus. I've seen, I think maybe 
I saw the first three or four episodes. It is so much fun. Marvel Cinematic Universe, people are going to lose their minds. You're going to have so much fun. It is great, 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 great cast and all of that. And, you know, last year I talked a lot about P-Valley. That's me and my girl, Ellarica, um, from P-Valley. And, um, you know, people always say, keep your kids off the pole. But needless to say, there I am <laughs> on the pole acting a pure D fool. Yes, Real Review. I'm so glad you're excited for Miss Marvel. I am too. Uh, it's really good. You're going to love it. And then if I couldn't, and as if I wasn't on the pole enough, after I got done it, I could actually keep my legs up. I took that picture to give this the pole dancer, the illustrious pole dancer, a high five. Baby, the things that she was doing with them legs, I was totally enthralled by what she was able to do with them legs. So I have so much to tell you guys. Let's talk a little bit about um, hustle. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about hustle. Before I, yeah, let's talk a little bit about hustle. So hustle is this Adam Sandler movie that is kind of like, it's like if Rocky went to the NBA, if Rocky was centered around the NBA, that is what Hustle is. It is gonna drop on Netflix on June 8th. It's starring Adam Sandler, Queen Latifah, Jaleel White, Robert Duvall. It's directed by Jeremiah Zagger. It's produced by LeBron James, Adam Sandler, Jeff Kirschenbaum, Joe Roth, Zach Roth, and Maverick Carter. And it deals with the fact that Stanley Sugarman is an NBA agent who, has ambitions of being a coach and he remains stuck out on the road looking for the next big big next big thing when he discovers Bo Cruz, NBA player Juancho Hernan Gomez, Hernan Gomez, who is like, I don't even know how tall uh Juancho is, but he's superior tall and he's fine too. I was like, oh okay, Juancho, he's really fine. Um but this film is really interesting because it, it embark it it highlights a lot of different things. It talks about, it, it deals with this coach played by Adam Sander, Sandler, Stan, who is in his 50s. And there's a line in the film where he says, guys in their 50s don't have dreams. They have nightmares and eczema, which made me laugh out loud. Um, there are numerous NBA uh, stars and players and coaches and pundits playing themselves. Anybody that is a fan of the sport is going to love this film. And Adam Sandler produced this film. And so I feel like this was someone who loves sports that made a film for themselves and the fans. It's, in ve it's very inspirational. Adam Sandler is magnificent. Like, I, I, let me just, let me just say something. Let me just come back on camera so I can, so I can just say this, because this is the thing about Adam Sandler. I am a huge Adam Sandler fan. I know. I don't look like somebody that looks like they would like Adam Sandler, but I kind of love Adam Sandler. Why? Because he is a comedian who, when he takes on dramatic parts, he keeps it 100% real. There is no illusions or game playing in his acting. He, he keeps it 100. And I appreciate that. And I respect that. I really do. So that's what I wanted to say about Adam Sandler. I also want to say that I loved him being a girl daddy. I loved him being a girl daddy. And I loved that he made want to show a girl daddy too. Girl daddies were on parade in this movie. And um, I also loved these two things about the film. It's not what you know, it's who knows you. And if nobody else believes in you, you got to believe in yourself. That's what I'm talking about with the inspirational part of this film. They can't kill you if you're already dead. So what you got to lose, as, as I'm quoting from the film, can you tell that I liked it? <laughs> Uh, Adam Sandler is magnificent in this film, y'all. So again, it's going to hit Netflix on June 8th. Please make sure that you check it out. Now, another film that I saw is this film called Lost Illusions. Like I said, it was a Cesar Renner, um, which is the precursor to the Cannes Film Festival. And it drops in theaters this Friday. It's directed by Xavier Ginoli. Ginoli um, and it takes on the old business of fake news. So you know how there's always some rumor that's abound and people just kind of believe it because they don't have anything to counteract it. This is a period piece that deals with that. And it deals with Lucian and his, uh, he's a lower class poet. He leaves his fan family's printing house for Paris and soon learns the dark side of the arts business as he, as he tries to stay true to his dreams. 
i.e. the fake news interrupts all of that. It is very kitschy. It is a lot of fun. If you love period piece films, you will love this movie. I loved this movie. I'm hoping that it sees a life that, that you know, we see it when, when Oscar time rolls around next year. And I hope that um, we hear more about it if, when it plays Sundance or if it's going to play some of the other festivals. Because it really is it's spectacularly, it's spectacularly shot. It's expertly directed. And it is written, well, the writing up and the costume, I can't say enough about it. It's it's really superb. It's really superb. <laughs> um, I was looking at the comments. That's what I'm laughing at. Um, okay, so there's that. And now let's get to the one y'all came here for me to talk about. Let's talk about Miss Jurassic World Dominion. Now, it drops in theaters on uh, June 9th, I think. It's a Universal Pictures joint. It's directed by Colin Trevorrow. It stars Chris Pratt, Bryce Dallas Howard, Jeff Goldblum, Laura Dern, Sam Neill, DeWanda Wise, B.D. Wong, and Mama Du Athi. And it picks up four years later after the destruction of Isla Nublar, dinosaurs are now alive and hunt alongside humans all over the world. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know how Jurassic Park is at the Universal Studios theme park? It's like if they had real dinosaurs in the theme park and they and some people have dinosaurs as pets, it is wild. The fragile balance will reshape the future and determine once and for all whether human beings are to remain the apex predators on the planet they now share with history's most famous creatures in a new era so that is the premise of jurassic world dominion this is the thing this is the sixth film in this franchise it is a beloved franchise as i have been saying this is the summer of blockbusters this is the nostalgic summer a lot of films that we have seen the first time around are having these sequels, Jurassic World, Top Gun, Mission Impossible is coming up soon. Um, Bob's Burgers was a spinoff from the TV series. We have all of these movies coming this summer. And after two years of being shut in the house, y'all, folk want to get to the theater. They want to laugh. They want to, you know, have some fun. So um, I say check it out. It was fun. And what I love most about this particular incarnation of it is that most of the time in these action adventure summer blockbuster movies, I'm going to use Indiana Jones as an example. Usually the guy is the big, strong hero and the woman is like, oh, please save me. Right. That is not happening in Jurassic World Dominion. These dolls, DeWanda Wise, Bryce Dallas, Dallas Howard, and Laura Dern are holding their own. They are doing the damn thing. And they are strong. They are smart. They are everything that a woman of this century is expected to be and is. So that, for the, for the young feminists out there, they are going to get their entire life with that aspect of the film. And I love that it's skewed toward feminism because Laura Dern's character in the first film was a really strong feminist and had some iconic lines. I don't need to repeat them here for y'all because y'all already know what they are. But I love that twist on it. Now, having said that, I've got two of the three women with me today. I have Laura Dern and I have DeWanda Weiss. So, but before we get to the ladies, you know, it's always ladies first, but I'm going to flip it up a little bit and we're going to get to the men first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this interview with Mama Do first and then we'll work our way down through the ladies. Here we go. Take a look and a listen to this interview with Mama Do Athi from Jurassic World Dominion. Hey, Mama Do. Hey, Carla. Nice to what meet you. What was you giggling about when we when I came in here? <laughs> oh, because I wanted to say hi, but you were talking. So I started laughing. Uh -huh. <laughs> So, that's always a, that's always a good way to start. Laughter is always a beautiful thing. Yeah. So we have something in common. You grew up. I know you're from. You were born someplace else, but you grew up in New Carrollton, Maryland, right? You grew up in New Carrollton, Maryland. Stop it. I did not grow up in New Carrollton, Maryland, yeah. but I did graduate <laughs> from Howard University, so I know exactly where New Carrollton, Maryland is. As a matter of fact, every time I hear New Carrollton, all I think about is the Metro stop. Of course, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say Because <laughs> then the orange line, oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, oh, I have to bring this up because that is pure comedy to me. Yeah, that's great. So, um... You are part of this iconic franchise. How are you feeling about that? Are you stoked? Because honestly, 
this franchise, we don't see a whole lot of us in Jurassic World. So up until now, we, we've been sprinkled here and there, but there's a whole bunch of us in this one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, look, I keep it real. I shoot straight from there. You sure do. I love it. Uh, <laughs> it's it's honestly a pleasure. Um, truly a pleasure. And not even just because of the franchise. And, and that is cool. And, and, and it is a, a part of a cinema history, which I really appreciate. But um what's most important to me is to work with really cool people that I enjoy working with. Otherwise, I mean, you know, I'll just do another job. And uh, this fortunately was one of those jobs where I just had a great time getting to know everybody, working with everybody and learning from everyone. So Ramsey, yeah. as well as Kayla, you guys both are struggling with this morality kind of thing, right? So you're battling with the morality of what serves you versus what serves the world at large. Yeah. Have you? Yeah. So how, what are your thoughts about that? And what are your thoughts about you as Mama Do? Have you ever been in that same space? Uh, I, 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 I just really love this question. Um, I, it's one of the, <laughs> it's one of those things where I, I yeah, Ramsey. I mean, it's 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 where we see the world today. I, 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 I'm a little confused. I find myself constantly confused about the state of the world and what people are thinking. Like, where is the long term thinking or at least enlightened self-interest in that, you know, clearly this might be good for you in the in the immediate. Sure, I get that. But that's not good for you or anyone else in a couple of years. Like, what are we what are we doing here? Um, so I I I really love that that was a part of his struggle, um, even pre the events of the films. Um, and and as far as me, I I. <laughs> I'm pretty clear about what I want and um, what I feel good about and what it will make me sleep well at night. So uh, I, I've been fortunate to not have much struggle <laughs> with what I feel like I got to do for the, for the greater good, or at least what makes me feel good. That's a beautiful thing. And last but not least, mm -hmm. you're in a movie with Chris Pratt. There had to have been a day where y'all were like giggling. He made you break up. Like oh, there had to be a day where y'all just like lost it. Forget about it. Forget about it. Every day I was on set with that dude. That dude is hilarious. Yeah, we had a really good time. We had a really, really, really good time. He's a cool guy. Cool. And so are you. You're a cool guy, too. And oh. P.S. and FYI, but not really. I loved you in Uncorked and Black Box. So I just want to say that before we go out. I'm, it's my pleasure to be able to finally speak to you. I hope we get to do it many more times moving Let's forward. Let's do it again, Carla. Thank you so much. And thanks for saying that. Those movies I loved making as well. So thank you. I got you, Mama Do. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, me and her real review are on the same page because I loved him in Uncorked and Black Box too. As you can tell, I just told him that. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit before I get to the ladies. I want to talk a little bit about Felicia Henderson. I love her work. I'm a huge fan of her work. I have been following her for decades and I'm so excited that I finally had an opportunity to talk to her about her Netflix series that's coming right in time for Pride Month. It's called First Kill. It's dealing with a black family and a vampire genre. There's some LGBTQ um, action happening with the characters and it's just all encompassing. And PS and FYI, but not really. I told her the last time I saw Black Vampires was Eddie Murphy with Vampire in Brooklyn and Death by Temptation with uh, Kadeem Hardison from A Different World. So having said that, Take a look and a listen to this interview with my girl, Felicia Henderson from First Kill on Netflix. How you go from soul food to vampires? <laughs> Where'd I do that at? <laughs> Why'd you do that? <laughs> I appreciate that question. You know, it really is the child of soul food from the point of view. Stay with me, stay with me. Okay, because I'm like, where's she going now? Okay, from the point of view of delving into and the exploration of the black family. Okay. Because what where we don't see, haven't seen, time to see the black family is in genre. Okay. So when you see the way they interact, when you see the stuff that happens at home, when you see the black mama who is not to be messed with, all of that you'll be like, it is the child of soul food. Because she very much, it very much is this family and the family dynamics and, you know, um, how they treat each other and what at the center of all of it is love. Even when they disagree, whenever, you know, family first, 
And that was absolutely what soul food was about. Family first, no matter what's going on. I might hate you today. I might, but if it comes down to it, family is first. Okay. I, I was like, where's she going? But you got me. You got me. Okay, I'm, I'm, right me you, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. <laughs> because girl, I was like, I don't, I can't, I can only recall two different projects where I saw black vampires. One was Death by Temptation with Kadeem mm-hmm. Hardison. And the other I one was Vampire that. in Brooklyn with Eddie Murphy. With Eddie Murphy. So, yes. Yes. You know what I mean? And so yes. I was like, is this a campy show? Like, what is this happening? And then I read the the um, description and it talked about family. And I knew that you were um, the creator of Soul Food. So I'm like, okay, let's see how we're going to bring this full circle and around. That's it. right. So and that. then it's always, you know, when you talk about sort of that that the breadth of my work in that way. And you know this, whenever we start in something that finally we are in the place that is at least in the field we want to be in, you get in where you fit in. Mm. So I started in sitcoms and I was very happy and blessed and, you know, because I wanted to be a writer. Um, And so the first job, you take those jobs. I tell the, you know, kids I mentor, and they're like, should I take the job porn cop? Yes, you should. <laughs> you know, so um, I believe in that, you know, and but truly, Carla, like I've been reading comic books since I was eight or nine. I was about to say, I read that you said you were a true blurred at heart. Yeah, it's it is very true. Like, so that might not have been where my career started as a writer. Right. Was writing that. But it was part of who I was. So in some ways this feels very natural and right to me in terms of my personal interest, finally, um, my professional interest, finally catching up to my personal interest. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. and being able to bring everything together that I love, you know, I love writing about family. I love writing about, you know, uh, the, in the YA space, you know, um, about messy teenagers. And I love writing about family. And that I, you know, love genre, um, you know, with, before this, I came off of uh, The Punisher, you know, so it's what I love. So being able to go, but that was all action and murder and mayhem, you know, so being able to go, <laughs> I'll take some family and some murder and mayhem. And, and throw them together. together. I'm in heaven. <laughs> Listen, I am not mad at you. And just to to bring it all first full circle. Tell me about, I read something about Victoria V.E. Schwab anthology of books and how that brought you to first kill. Yes. So Victoria um, Schwab um, also um, writes under the pen name V.E. Schwab. Um, She wrote a short story. She's very, very successful in in this space, Um, you know, multiple times on the New York Times bestseller list. So she is a force to be reckoned with. But she wrote this short story um, called First Kill that's in an anthology called Vampires Never Get Old. And um, and from that, and, and Netflix saw that short story, loved it, and asked her to adapt it in, for television. So Victoria wrote the pilot, and then they were looking for a head writer, showrunner, um, and reached out to my manager. And he was like, I know you're plate is full. I'm like, my plate is beyond full. (laughs) So, but I think this might be for you. And um, I very, very reluctantly read the script and I loved it. I was like, like I just told you, I'm like, it's everything I love. It's family, it's genre, you know, it's action, it's strong women at the center. It's everything. So I'm like, yes, I'll take that meeting. So um, I was then, you know, was hired and they brought me in to one, take a look at that pilot script and look at, you know, and I love Victoria for this because she really took it upon herself and said, you know, they're not enough as a white woman, they're not enough black folks in vampire and, you know, and and in genre. And I want to create something where they are. But she then was also smart enough as was Netflix to say, but I'm not that. And so let's go find that. And I, my hat goes off to Netflix and to her to know that what I brought to the table is what was missing from the table. And I love that. Yeah. And so I, I really, I had mad respect for that. And then gave me the freedom to go, 
let me take a stab at this, this, this Black family so that I could add a little, you know, cultural specificity to them, not saying all Black people are the same, we are not monolithic, but there's some truisms that I knew would resonate, you know, um, and also a way to sort of differentiate, if you would, will, you know, the, the, the white family of vampires and how they interact from the Black to celebrate difference. Difference is not the problem. You know, it's in our world, they're always like, well, if we just focus on what we have in common, I don't believe in that. I think if we just respect how we are different and learn from each other, then the world will be a better place. So for me, I lean into how they're different. Difference is not the enemy. It is a lack of respect for difference, right? So right. I lean into and Calliope's home, um, her brothers know, talk the wrong way. And your mama might just say, you must have somewhere else to live if you're talking to me like that. You know, whereas in Juliet's house, um, there's more, let's talk to her and find out what's wrong with her and why is our child behaving, you know? So there's more of that. And maybe perhaps a little more agency for Juliet um, because Juliet doesn't have the burden of her blackness that, that Calliope has. And so I wanted to lean into all of that. I didn't want to run away from all of that. I wanted to lean into it and treat it as special as opposed to something to stay away from. Well, listen, I got mad respect for you. I'm so glad that you carved out some time in your schedule because you are mad busy if you, as you have already stated. So I really <laughs> appreciate the fact. That I appreciate you, you wanting to talk to me. And when you say I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time, I'm like, why haven't we talked then? I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time because I've seen all your work and I and I admire and I respect what you do as a woman of color in this space. And I also respect the fact that you are a woman of color that is delving outside of the norm into genre like Jordan Peele has and so many others are starting to do. So thank you for that. I appreciate you. Thank you. Well, and you know, including my name in any conversation with Jordan Peele is an it's an honor. So thank you for that. And I, I mean, I appreciate you again for taking this time. I can't wait for you to see the show. Um, I think you're going to love it. And I look forward to hearing what you think about it. Um, you know, we're, we're partying on Thursday night and then the show drops at midnight all over the world in 190 countries all at the same time. Wow. Um, so I'm excited about that, too, because what we're doing, you know, for representation um, for representation of Black folks, for representation of queer love, for representation of young girls who don't get to see, who may, you know, for whoever you love, just putting that at the center and going, no big deal, this show isn't about who you love. It's about the fact that you're a three-dimensional human being with, with you know, thoughts and ideas and goals and dreams. We're going to focus on all of that. And there's so many people going to get to see us do it. Yay. Yay. Well, it's dropping right on time because this is Pride Month. So yes. you know, it's dropping right on time. Uh, All right, absolutely. Miss Felicia Henderson, party and get a cocktail for me on Thursday. <laughs> I will do that. Thank you so much for your time, Carla. You're welcome. Bye now. Okay, have a good one. Bye-bye. And I meant what I said. I really, what is going on with me in this light today? Okay, there we go. I really do have a lot of affection for Felicia Henderson and what she does. She is one of our OGs in, in the television genre. And it's nice to see that she's still out there creating um, timely, critical content. So again, you guys check out First Kill. It is dropping on Netflix June 8th. And um, yeah, check it out, check it out. Speaking of Pride Month, I wanna tell y'all about this other movie that made me tee hee hee. It's called Fire Island. It's produced by Searchlight Pictures. Um, it's directed by Andrew Ahn. It's starring Bowen Yang as Noah. It's starring um, Conrad Ricamora as Will and Margaret Cho as Aaron. And it's like, <laughs> it is an all encompassing love story centered in the LGBTQ community, but it is hella funny. It's like, going to gay Disneyland on cinema <laughs> because that's what the gays call Fire Island. They call it gay Disneyland. That Willy Wonka theme playing at the beginning is hilarious and made me holler out loud. And 
this is what they always say. They say everyone should get busy on Fire Island at least once. It's your it's like a birthright. Um, I, <laughs> there's a big joke, and I love this. I love this that they make this joke. There is a gaze in space SNL sketch that is crazy. But the fact that Bo and Yang was on SNL and they keep making reference to this sketch throughout this movie makes me holla out loud. It is so, so funny. Um, it's an unorthodox rom-com. And um, I have to say that Noah and Will dance into Last Dance by Donna Summer on the pier gave me life. But you will love this. It's an un it's an unorthodox rom-com where um, these two best friends set out to have a legendary last week long summer vacation at Fire Island. And it's a group of them and their electric, elect, eclectic friends. And it's just, it's just fun. It'll just put a smile on your face and it'll make you really happy. It's called Fire Island. Check it out. It is, um, it is on Searchlight Pictures. Um, and I think you might be, because it's on search, because it was released through Searchlight Pictures, I think you may be able to find it on Hulu, which is part of the Disney family. All right. So um, moving on with the with the gals from Jurassic World, I want to let y'all take a look and a listen to this interview with DeWanda Weiss. She is a trip and I absolutely love speaking with her. So here we go. DeWanda Weiss from Jurassic World Dominion. Hey, DeWanda, what's up? Hi, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, sis? Doing well, doing really well. Thank you for asking. So listen, we got a little something in common. I graduated from Howard University, which is close to Columbia, Maryland, but not yes, too close. Is. Yes, And it I is. know that you went to high school there, so we got that in common. Yes, DMV. And we also, right, DMV? <laughs> we, we also have um, this in common. Your character um, is in the military as a pilot and my dad was in the military. Yeah, that tracks, um, you know, I was, I talk about that a lot. I come from a military family, it's Maryland, you know, Fort Meade's right there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, girl. So let's talk about this. You are a part of this iconic franchise, which I'm so, 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 so excited about. Did you choose Kayla or did Kayla choose you? <laughs> I, I'm definitely a destiny actor, uh, however that comes across, but I do, I think, you know, characters, choose you. I think uh, this one has a little bit of reciprocity because, you know, there obviously has to be something um, that Colin saw, you know, a bit of Kayla um, in my work somewhere. So I, I can recognize that. But also, you know, there wasn't enough um, here for him to be like, oh, that's exactly what she can do. There's no evidence. I've never been in an action movie before. You know what I mean? So, um so yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of both. I love that we're starting to see more um, African American women in these action roles. You know, being kind of badass and holding their own. I love, 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 love that. But Kayla is the type of doll who um, she's sort of finding her moral compass, so to speak, again, yes. and remembering that that looking away from something that you know is wrong is not enough. What? How does that resonate with you as Dewanda? I love that you picked up on that. Thank you. See, we here. We here, girl. Thank we here, you DW. Much. You know, I mean, one, it just resonated because um, I don't think you have to be perfect or have it all together to do the right thing. You know, so I, when I read it, I was really moved by it because I just recognized that she was at a certain kind of turning point in her life. And there's a lot that can happen to us, right, to make us the kind of people that's just like, I just got to take care of number one. You know, it's just that's it's very natural. Of course, you you know, you get to a place in your life where you're like, look, I'm not going to be able to save everybody. I can't change the world. The world is not changing anytime soon. So I'm just going to take care of number one. And, you know, when we meet her, she's absolutely at the end of the line. And knowing that, you know, she has strayed far from the kind of exactly as you've described it, her own moral compass. And she's outside of her integrity when we first meet her. So really her hero's journey is about, is about getting back to, you know, eternal, like an inner alignment. And that just happens to physically manifest in the way that we see it in the movie. Yeah. I love that you talk about the strongness of women and particularly with black women, we are 
or we are expected to be so resilient and mentally strong when it comes to ourselves and those that we ride or die for, or even those that we love really hard for. So I was really happy to hear you um, mention that. What was the craziest day you had on set? Because this was the first time you worked with green screen, right? Yes. It was the first time I worked with green screen. A lot of it was practical. You know, a lot of it was practical. I mean, and the first day, the craziest days I've had were my first days, you know, because I honestly, you know, you don't know to what extent you're going to be doing whatever it is. And, you know, I can tell you for sure, uh, because Chris Pratt is the kind of actor who can look at a stunt and learn it and execute it. I was like, oh, so I guess that's what I'm doing. I guess I'll be doing that as well. Um, You know, all of them. So it was just a kind of a really, really steep a uh, fast learning curve. You know, you come in prepared as you can. You know, I had the physical conditioning. I was definitely like physically ready. You know what I mean? Oh, I, I can like, see that. Yeah, I can I see that. The, the with that outfit. Thing. Yeah, exactly. I've done it, you know. Uh, but nothing pr- actually prepares you until you're there and you just have to be like, all right, take a deep breath and stretch these hamstrings and get ready to run. <laughs> you did not say, okay, girl, let's stretch these hamstrings. Let's get these quads and these glutes engaged. <laughs> Oh my God, I wish I had more time to talk to you because you are making me giggle. And there is nothing funny about Jurassic World, but (laughs) you are making me giggle and I kind of love you for it. (laughs) Thank you for your time, Dewanda. I appreciate you. you. Absolutely. All right. Bye, sis. Bye. (laughs) Baby, when she started talking about engaging certain parts of the body, which I can't even remember the last time I thought about engaging a part of anybody, part of my body. It made me holler out loud. All right. So I know a lot of you watching are waiting for this interview with Laura Dern. Let me give you a precursor to this. And we talk about this in the interview. But a little while ago, I met Laura Dern at a screening and I had just had knee surgery and I was struggling. And she was so kind and generous and warm and thoughtful. I'll never forget how she sat and talked to me and my mom for a minute. And it was supposed to be a date night with her son. Her son, after a while, was like, okay, mom, come on. But she literally took her time. She's a real one, y'all. She is a real one. And if if nothing else, go see Jurassic World just to support Laura Dern because she's a real one. But I kind of love the Wanda Wise, Mama Do Ivy, and Bryce Dallas Howard, and Chris Pratt, and Jeff Goldblum, too. So, you know, if you're a fan of the franchise, you're going to love the film. But let me just stop talking (laughs) and let y'all take a look and listen to this interview with Laura Dern. Here we go. Hi, Laura. Hello. Nice to see you. It is nice to be seen, Diva. Yes, it is. <laughs> At this crack of early morn, it is good to be seen. I mean, I and I have to say, it's amazing to be in human contact again. This is, you know, the first time I'm doing press and seeing old friends. So I'm so happy to see you. Oh, uh, absolutely. And ditto, same here. I just wanted to, I, ha- I promise I have a, um, a point with this when I start talking. So you, got, so you won't be like, where is she going? Okay. So, <laughs> so I wanted to say, I've been wanting to say this to you for quite some time. I think you are absolutely wonderful for a variety of reasons, but particularly because of this. I had just had knee surgery and was at LACMA watching the Malala documentary with my mom and I ran into you and you sat and talked you were on a date night with your son and you mm-hmm. sat and talked to me and my mom for a really long time. And I'll never forget how gracious and kind and thoughtful you were that evening. And I've been wanting to tell you that Aww. for quite some time. So now I've had my opportunity. Bless you. That means so much to me. And I remember it. I remember our conversation. And I remember that night, you know, of course, as we all did seeing that film and Davis Guggenheim, who made the movie and I haven't seen since, I just ran into in the streets of New York last week. So wow. it's, a, it's a full circle to see you both in one week and uh, and very beautiful to be with your mom while I was with my son. How lovely. Yes. Okay. And now on with the show. <laughs> so 
we I, we're I'm calling summer of 2022 the nostalgic summer of blockbusters because there are a lot of films that we loved the first time around that are having franchise sequels to the original films, you know, like Mission Impossible, Top Gun, and now Jurassic. And usually in these blockbuster films, the men are holding everything down and the girls are just like, oh, please help me. But you and Bryce and DeWanda are holding it down. What does it feel like to be in the franchise 20 years later with that kind of spin on it? It feels amazing, you know, and as we all remember, I was I was the only uh, woman there uh, the first round. So to watch the franchise evolve and see these powerful women, you know, on either side of me as we came back together has been incredible. But also it speaks to the franchise that in its origin story, embedded in it, not to try to be current, this franchise was built on a female character from the book who is a doctor and an equal to the men. And when everything goes down and even men are injured, she's like, you guys take care of yourselves. I'm going to go save us. And by herself uh, saves the day and has you know, very lucky for me to get to have said them, rather iconic feminist lines. And it was 1993, and there had been very few women in the action genre that uh, were holding their own in that way. So I felt so proud of getting to play Ellie Sattler in the first time and having Steven Spielberg guide that kind of female character, her no-nonsense look in the film, her irreverence, um, but also to watch the franchise grow, as you mentioned, with these extraordinary women. I loved it. I did. I got my entire life watching it. I really, really did. Okay. And what I also loved this time around is, you know, it always cracks me up when there is an age difference between two characters, male and female. They make such a big deal out of it when they don't make as much of a deal out of it when is a man and a woman. Usually they don't. And when it's the woman that's 20 years older than the dude, we get called cougars. Like really yeah. though? Yeah. Why do All we have a name course. and they don't? I just want to, want to know your thoughts about that. Well, let's be clear. When I made the first movie, nobody was talking about it. That part. Because every movie, we were the leading lady to a man 20 years older than us. So it's only in this press junket that the conversation's even being had, which is great news. Um, lucky for me that it's the most dashing, charming leading man possible being Sam Neill. And we've been, you know, those of us who love the original story, longing to know what might happen to Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler if they ever met again. So that's all lovely, but you're absolutely right. It's about time to change the narrative when it comes to uh, it turning around. And I'm currently filming a movie and my leading man is the ever lovely Liam Hemsworth. And, and we're working on that at this very moment. I so love I, that. And, and there's no conversation about age. It's just two people meeting. So may, may we see more and more of that. Because yes, you're right. They're like, we don't know what to do this. I guess we need to give her a label. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, for this franchise, I think it's evolved and we've all evolved with it, um, even, even in being current and having conversations that need to be had. Now, as playing Ellie and being this expert in the dinosaur realm, as, as, we, as I'll say, what was the hardest terminology that you had to learn in the process? Because girls, some of those names, by the time you get to Rex, you're like, <laughs> I know, I know you're not kidding. I mean, how Demetrodon is easy for me. I don't know, but poor Colin Trevorrow, our director, every time I would arrive on set, I'm like, oh, the gigantosaurus. He's like, it's a giganotosaurus. I've told you this three times. <laughs> he had to remind me. It is Giganotosaurus, just for us all to know. Um, but he was and is so incredibly generous in when Steven Spielberg first mentioned the idea of me coming back and Frank Marshall, and then Colin and I sat to talk about 
who she would be today, as you mentioned in her expertise of paleontology, how would she evolve? And being the feminist that she was for us in 1993, where would she be as a woman in science, as an independent woman in her life, so that she stands to the things we expect of her? Um, and I love that they were very committed and collaborative to allow me in in the conversation that we really wanted her to be focused on climate change and be a soil scientist, which makes a lot of sense if your study has been how the last extinction happened, to do anything to avoid another. And um, and I hope her expertise and interest and the storyline that my character follows will get this next generation of dinosaur-loving movie fans um, talking about our food and our soil and how we can peacefully coexist and learn to take care of each other, which we we haven't been looking out for each other as we uh, deserve and must. So um, I hope these conversations will just be added to uh, to what we should all be talking about at dinner every night. I absolutely concur. Laura Dern, you are such a smart, savvy doll. It has been my pleasure to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for giving me a little bit of your time today. Oh. I cannot begin to tell you how much it means. Thank you so much. What a pleasure and privilege for me. And I hope I get to see you in person and soon. Ditto. All right. Lots of love. I told y'all, she's a real one. She is a real one. So again, y'all, Jurassic World Dominion is dropping on June, is it ninth? What is dropping this week? It's dropping Friday. <laughs> it's even dropping Thursday or Friday, but it's dropping this week. You can also catch out Fire Island, which is a Searchlight Pictures joint. You can catch Lost Illusions, which will be in theaters this week. And you can also catch, what was the other film that I talked about, y'all? Oh, First Kill. Uh, from Felicia Henderson from Soul Foods. Felicia Henderson is dropping on June 8th on Netflix. And Hustle, that was the other film. I knew it was one other movie. Hustle, which is also going to be on Netflix, is dropping on June 8th as well. So I will not be here live next week. It will be a taped show, but I got some goodies for y'all, baby. I got some goodies for y'all. I got um, Andy Garcia and Miss Gloria Estefan from Father of the Bride, which is also a Searchlight Pictures joint. Um, so I have that. I have a review of Brian and Charles. Marcel, the show with shoes on review. Um, hopefully I'll see Lightyear and I'll be able to talk about that. Spiderhead I'm going to have for you. And Juneteenth is coming up. So I'm going to highlight some things about Juneteenth. And I will have part one of my two Flowers in the Attic interviews um, that I did during the ATX uh, TV festival. So again, I am Carla Renata, the Kirby Film Critic. You have tuned into the Kirby Critic with Carla Renata. Again, if this is your first time here, give me a big old thumbs up to let me know that you was here because you know a sister can't know if you was here if I don't see the thumbs up. I'm just saying. <laughs> so please stay safe. Please stay sane. Continue to wash your hands. Wear the mask if you need to. And uh, I will catch you on the flip side. I'll see you next week, though, whether I'm taped or real. I will see you next week. All right. Take it light. Bye.